Noriel Rubini, bonsoir. Nous vous recevons pour une chaîne internet qui s'appelle Thinkerview. Nous sommes en direct. Est-ce que vous pouvez vous présenter succinctement uh, First of all, it's really a great pleasure and honor being here with you. I heard about uh, your program and so on. Very popular, so it's great to be in Paris, one of my very favorite cities in the world. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm an economist. Uh, I was born uh, in Istanbul, in Turkey. My family is a Jewish family from Iran. When I was a year old, we left Istanbul, went back to Tehran. By the age of three, we moved to Tel Aviv in Israel. And by the age of four, uh, we moved to Milano in Italy, where we settled and I grew up there. I went to school there. I did my university studies, first degree, at Bocconi University. And then in 1983, I came to the United States for my PhD uh, in economics at uh, Harvard University. Then I was a professor at Yale University for seven years. Then by 1995, I moved to New York University. I've been a professor since then. But uh, at some point, I started also being involved into economic policy. I spent two years in Washington, in the White House, and then the US Treasury Department when Clinton was president. Then I went back to academia, but then I started a few economic consultancies uh, around 2004, 2005. And I guess that I'm most well known for being one of the Few economists who predicted the global financial crisis of 2007-2009. At that point, I got this nickname of Dr. Doom. It's still sticking uh, today. And I've been involved in both uh, working as a speaker, as an academic, as an economic advisor, running economic consultancies, writing books. My latest one just published in France, Mega Threats, 10 Dangerous Trends, that imperil our future and how to survive them. And I now spend more than half of my time traveling around the world and make sense, in, make sense of this <clears throat> very complicated and unstable and certain world. I beg your pardon because uh, we've got some technical problems with the translation uh, technique, but it's my fault. Sorry for the, the moving hair plug every time. Je voulais vous remercier d'être venu parce que vous faites partie de ce, de ce petit nombre de personnes qui ont changé ma vie, qui m'ont appris à avoir des yeux dans le dos et à avoir un prisme de lecture à 360 degrés pour anticiper les menaces. Et c'est un réel plaisir pour moi de vous avoir ce soir. C'est comme mon petit cadeau de Noël. Je vais essayer de faire partager ça à notre communauté. On va creuser le sujet des menaces, de l'anticipation, de la prospective. Ma première question va avoir comme sujet pourquoi les gens ne veulent pas voir, ne veulent pas entendre quand des menaces arrivent Est-ce qu'on attaque tout le temps le messager ou est-ce que c'est simplement de la cécité ou du déni Well, that's a very good and important question. I think that um, there is something about uh, humanity, about trying to avoid uh, facing reality, uh, avoiding uh, worrying about the things can go wrong, because if you worry about them, uh, you have to prepare yourself, you have to take action. Those actions are costly in terms of time, money, and effort. And people live in the hope that something good is going to happen, maybe some force like God is going to come and rescue them from their trouble, or that some leader is going to come and make the right policies, avoid the crisis and so on, or there is some technological revolution or some kind of a good luck that's going to prevent them. So we tend to, as much as we can, to kick the can down the road. Sometimes when there's a threat, we put our heads in the sand like ostriches trying to avoid the problems. And whenever people like me warn about uh, the tail risks, uh, either they dismiss you saying you are Dr. Doom, 
or you're a Cassandra, or when I sound alarm, you know, they live like zombies, they want to go back to sleep, so they push the snooze button, and then when alarm again, snooze the button, and then this way you sleepwalk into not being aware of what's going on, and eventually you sleepwalk into disaster. Avant de développer euh, des questions concernant quelles sont les menaces, je veux vous poser la question, est-ce que pour vous, les politiques, les politiques occidentales, les hommes politiques, les femmes politiques, sont prêts, ont la réelle perception des menaces et ont-ils la capacité de résoudre des choses Est-ce que vous pouvez nous développer votre perception du politique et les menaces sur lesquelles auxquels on va être obligé de faire face um, Well, I would say it depends, of course, on the politicians. Um, some of them are more aware of these threats. Uh, some of them ignore them. Whether they're aware of them or not, uh, uh, politicians in democratic countries need to be re-elected, and therefore For example, among all these threats that I discuss in my book, each one of them has some solutions, but these solutions imply costs and sacrifices in the short run for a benefit that comes only over the medium long term. And if you do something unpopular, the risk is that you're not going to get reelected. And I'll give you one example, you know, a former councillor of Germany, Schroeder, He was a social democrat. He did reform to make the labor market more flexible. And that was one of the reasons why Germany became competitive. But then he lost the elections because those reforms were highly unpopular. Or take another more recent example. Right now, President of France, Macron, is proposing a pension reform that is highly unpopular, unpopular among the left the workers, the unions, the youth organization, unpopular on the right, among Le Pen and her voters. And it's a dilemma, because if he passes it unpopular, maybe through a decree or through an alliance with Republican forces, he could have massive demonstration, he could become even more unpopular, and the chances that uh, Le Pen may get, re may get elected in 2027 rise On the other side, if he doesn't do the reform, people are going to say, we elected you on a campaign of proposal for reform. What have you done for all these years? And maybe it becomes unpopular because of that. And then maybe whoever is going to be a representative of his party or moderate forces could still lose in 2027. Um, even in non-democracies, I think it's difficult. Uh, people say autocratic regimes can make tough choices. That's not truly really the case because even in autocratic regimes like China, you have to be sensitive to popular opinion, uh, one. Two, you have to make tough decisions that imply cost in the short run. Three, sometimes autocrats live in a bubble, like Putin lived in a bubble. He didn't realize the risks because nobody wanted to tell him. They were scared of him. And I think that Xi Jinping also lives in a bubble If nobody wants to say the emperor has no clothes or our policy doesn't work. And therefore, in autocracies, you also make uh, terrible decisions. You know, rightly, Winston Churchill once said that, that democracy is the worst political system apart from all the alternatives. And it's true. I still believe that with all the difficulties of liberal democracy, it's a better system of governance than having and autocratic regimes. Autocratic regimes make major mistakes, economic, social. Sometimes they become aggressive and violent. When domestically you have a problem, you find some scapegoat, some external potential threat or invented threat. And often dictators end up going to war. Putin did it, the Argentine junta did it, and many other examples of that. Pour vous, les, les dix menaces que les politiques et leur population vont être obligés de faire face, à quel prix et à quelle échéance de temps 
Celle qui va arriver tout de suite maintenant, c'est quoi La crise de la dette, la crise géopolitique, la crise alimentaire, la crise des dettes souveraines, la crise des banques centrales qui relèvent les taux, l'insoutenabilité des dettes, le réchauffement climatique um, it's interesting because I, I wrote uh, this book uh, about how the world can evolve in the next 10 to 20 years. And of course, some of those threats are more slow motion. Some of them are more imminent. But um, even those that look like more in the future, I can give you many examples of how each one of these 10 threats is materializing today, not a year from now, not five years from now. I can give you 10 examples for each one of these 10 threats. So, of course, in the short run, the risk of inflation, the risk of recession, what we call stagflation, the combination of inflation and recession, is a significant material risk for US, Europe, advanced economies. The risk of uh, debt becoming unsustainable as central bank increase interest rates is also a short-term threat. But, for example, Think about the risk of uh, geopolitical uh, tensions. The risk of war between great powers as a reason is not just anymore a cold war between uh, US and a number of uh, revisionist powers who challenge the economic, social, monetary, trade, political, military order that the US Europe and the West created after World War II. These revisionist powers being China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and even Pakistan that effectively highlight. But today, it's not just a cold war. We already have a hot war between uh, Russia and Ukraine. This is effectively already a proxy war between the US and Europe on one side, the West and Russia. This war could under some condition become unconventional if Putin decides to use tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine. And it could also involve the, uh, NATO. So it's a threat that is immediate. It's not 10 years from now. I was just spending 10 days in Israel before coming to Europe. And uh, at this point, it's clear that Iran is a threshold nuclear state and Israel in the next year or so, together with the US, will have to make tough decisions on whether to strike Iran or not. And there are costs and benefits of doing one or the other. Plus, the Middle East overall is a powder keg. You have the Sunni-Shia tensions. You already have these proxy wars leading to failed states in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, in Libya, in Yemen, and things could escalate more. And of course, in Asia, this Cold War between US and China is becoming colder. And the head of the US Navy, a couple of months ago, made a statement in the front page of the Financial Times saying that the chances that China may invade Taiwan are high, not five or 10 years from now. He said at that time it could happen before 2024. This was in October of last year. Well, before 2024 means 2023. We are right now, 2023. Now, I'm not claiming that that war between US and China on the issue of Taiwan is gonna occur this year, but even this geopolitical depression and the risk of a war between great powers, all of which, by the way, have a nuclear weapon or effectively like Iran are getting there, it's a risk that is a new risk that did not exist. I grew up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and I never worried about war between great powers or a nuclear winter, because uh, Nixon went to China. There was a detente between the US and the Soviet Union, and the risk of a nuclear war between these rivals that had nuclear weapon became very low, not zero, but very low. Today, for the first time in a long time, we have to worry about war between great powers and a war that from conventional, 
of course, would automatically become unconventional when you start killing each other. So even things that look like medium long term, global climate change, uh, pandemics, or war between great power, or the impact, say, of artificial intelligence, robotic and automation, these things are already happening today. Even if, of course, compared to inflation and stagflation, there are more slow motion train wrecks. Est-ce que vous pouvez me décrire ce qu'il faudrait faire après le constat, par exemple, sur le réchauffement climatique, est-ce que les populations sont prêtes à accueillir des, des pays à risque, exposés plus rapidement au réchauffement climatique Est-ce que l'immigration pourrait sauver l'économie Est-ce qu'il faut continuer la croissance Est-ce que les, les politiques ont cette capacité à faire passer ce qu'il faudrait faire Ou, ou, ou sont-ils sont conscients de tout ça vous avez des, eu des rapports avec François Hollande, avec Emmanuel Macron. Est-ce que vous les avez sentis avec les choses de façon... Est-ce qu'ils sont conscients de tout ça ou est-ce qu'ils survolent les choses Well, different politicians to different degrees uh, are aware of the problem. Uh, the problem is that uh, while we all worry about the climate change, and it's one of the biggest risks because it could literally destroy the planet in the next few decades. Finding solution is difficult for many and different reasons. There are several of them of why, unquote, we're not doing the right thing. You know, reason number one, uh, in many countries, starting with the United States, some part of the population does not even believe in human-driven climate change. So in US, when the Republicans are in power, they don't do anything. And sometimes they are in power. And they may come back in power in 2024. Second problem is an intergenerational conflict. You know, I'm 64. If I live another 30 years, I'll be lucky. A young man or woman born today has a life expectancy of at least 100 years. So he or she will have to deal with the mess of climate change. But young people don't tend to vote, old people do. And even the young people, we tend to discount the future, hoping that maybe some miracle, some technology is gonna resolve. So how many people are willing to change their lifestyle today, even younger, to deal with reducing their own carbon footprint? If we all were vegan, one quarter of all greenhouse emissions comes from livestock agriculture. How many of us are willing to insulate fully our homes, putting solar panel, using reusable bags, wherever we go? How many of us, we all have closets full of clothes, t-shirts, shirts, pants, we never wear. Each one of them causes pollution. What we buy, we overconsume. So there is this conflict in young and old as well. Three, globally, if a country makes all the work and effort to reduce their net emission to zero, it's highly costly, but nobody else does. They don't get any benefits. The emissions are global and you pay the cost. And coordinating between 200 countries on that is very hard. There's a free rider problem, what they call it. Problem number four, there is a conflict between poor countries and rich countries. US and Europe are telling China, India, emerging market, cut your emission to zero over the next 20 years like we want to do it. But they say, you guys created this problem with 200 years of history of industrialization, 90% of all the cumulative stock of past emission is you guys. It's true that the current new flow of new emission comes a lot from China, India and other emerging markets. They say, you create a problem, we want, don't want to stay poor, we're going to increase our emission for another 20 years until we are wealthy enough, and then we're going to deal with that problem, unless you give us subsidies enough to pay the cost today. But the subsidies are estimated in at least a trillion dollars per year that the rich will have to transfer to the poor. The US Congress just passed a, 
bill where they give to emerging markets four billion. It's just spare change. You need a trillion. Of course, no country is going to do it. Problem number five. There is a conflict between U.S. and China, Cold War. They don't agree on pandemics. They blame each other. They don't agree on global security. They don't agree on free trade. They don't agree on how to deal with economic and financial crisis. And of course, they don't agree on climate change and we should be doing it and so on and so on. Problem number six. Um, in order to achieve the Paris Accord targets, the average carbon tax should be $200 per ton. Today, the average carbon tax is $2 per ton. Less in US, a little bit more in Europe. Which politician is going to increase carbon taxes by a factor of 100 from 2 to 200? No one. It's politically impossible. If anything, we're doing the contrary. Now that fuel prices are high, heating costs are high, every politician is cutting fuel taxes, carbon taxes, to reduce inflation for the people. But if those taxes are not high, the transition from fossil fuel to renewable is not going to occur. You need to give the price incentive. Finally, of the three solutions for climate change, mitigation, net zero, implies a negative economic growth forever. In 2020, we had the worst recession in the last 60 years. Net emission fell only by 9%. 9% is not, and now they're well above the pre COVID level. So mitigation with current technology is impossible, negative growth. Adaptation, that means let temperature go well above two, well above three, and then you limit the cost of it, costs you trillions of dollars of money. Give you one example. Since New York, you had the hurricane Sandy and sea rise level, they wanted to protect Manhattan. First, there was a proposal to build a wall around Manhattan. Then they say, it's going to look like a prison, ugly. Now they say they want to build these levees in the water, levees near the Verrazzano Bridge. That plan is going to cost $125 billion. It's going to take 25 years. It might be obsolete by the time you do it. It might not work. It deals only with storm surges when water's up because of a storm. It doesn't deal with sea level rises that are permanent. And if you protect uh, Manhattan, you're going to flood everything else, Long Island, Jersey Shore, and the rest of New York. This is one city, one of the richest in the world, and 40% of people live around coastal areas. So mitigation, impossible, adaptation too expensive, and those other solutions, geoengineering, like throwing dust in the sky to reflect the sun, light, is like freak science. And I can tell you other constraints to do the right thing. I just give you some examples. That's the gap between what you want to do and reality. That's why there is so much greenwashing, there is so much green wishing, there is so much green leaf. That's why so much of ESG investment is just bullshit. And there is why there is also lots of green inflation to produce green metals that are needed in green cars, electric vehicles, electric batteries, lithium, cobalt, copper, zinc. You need a lot of energy. And if the price of fossil fuel is high, there's green inflation. The price of green metal production is expensive and we cannot do them cheaply as well. So these are the facts that you have to talk about. But most people talk about the platitudes, if we do only so and so, so and so and so, we deal with climate change. And this is just one of the mega threats. On each one of them, there's a wide range of obstacles and constraints to doing the right thing. La chaîne de transmission entre votre cerveau, le cerveau des politiques, le cerveau de la population, c'est le journalisme. Est-ce que vous pensez que le journalisme ou le journaliste est suffisamment affûté pour comprendre ce type de menace et suffisamment courageux pour écrire les bons papiers Je prends l'exemple, vous, vous annonciez la crise de 2008 et les journalistes, avec l'aide de différents économistes, vous sont tombés dessus. C'est parce qu'ils ne comprenaient pas C'est parce qu'ils étaient motivés pour vous faire taire 
c'était quoi Est-ce que les journalistes sont suffisamment affûtés par rapport aux risques Well, it, it depends. There is good media, sophisticated enough, who can talk about the risks uh, and report them and discuss them. There are others who are not uh, as qualified to do so. But, you know, in the case of, say, the global financial crisis, again, you have to understand the motivations uh, that led to this bubble. You know, homeowners, could buy homes with very little equity. They could borrow against their kind of homes and the prices were going higher, so they were happy. The politicians were happy because people who could spend more of their income based on a bubble in their homes. The banks were lending the money and making mortgages and making money on it. The investment banks were securitizing all these mortgages and repackaging them and making money. The rating agencies were rating these toxic uh, uh, securities of mortgages and they were making money. The appraisers of the home were making money by doing fees. And uh, the insurers of these derivatives also were making money. So you had a securitization chain where everybody in this chain was making money. Households were happy, politicians were happy, Wall Street was happy, and everybody lived in a bubble. And once you live in a bubble, you start believing something that is not possible, that home prices can increase every year 20% forever. And this is not a bubble, until, of course, the bubble burst. So, you know, the masses have their own delusions. The politician feeds on those delusions, and usually, Businesses and financial institutions make money out of these delusions as well. So sometimes we live in a bubble, we live in a delusion until the bubble pops and the dream becomes a nightmare. So it happens over and over again. The story of all the financial bubbles is about delusion of the masses, greedy investors and financiers who feed the bubble and politicians that also make money out of it or they benefit from these bubbles from occurring. En anticipant tous ces risques, en, en anticipant tous ces risques, est-ce que vous pensez que ça va se terminer dans un bain sanglant en termes d'émeute, d'instabilité sociale, de tension entre les minorités Est-ce que vous sentez ce, ce petit murmure de d'émeute Um, certainly, one of the consequences of all these uh, threats and of all this instability is the risk of uh, social strife of various sorts. Could be labor strife, could be violence between right and left, could be the rise of extremist uh, populist parties of extreme and right and left could be also some of these populist and authoritarian regimes becoming aggressive when they have trouble at home, they find a, a pseudo enemy kind of, and then they go to war like Russia did in the case of Ukraine. So definitely we see a rise in income and wealth inequality. We see the middle class and working class feel squeezed. We see the young generation feels that they don't have as much economic opportunity that maybe the new generation is going to be poorer than their own parents. And all of this is leading to a backlash against the liberal democracy. And you have authoritarian populist parties of right and left uh, more popular, you know. Today you have uh, Putin in Russia, you have Erdogan in Turkey, you have Orban in uh, Hungary, you have Kaczynski in Poland, uh, Meloni and her neo-fascist party came to power recently in Italy. The Swedish Democrats were effectively neo-Nazi party are going to be part of the ruling coalition, even in a tolerant Sweden. In uh, Britain, you got the Brexit phenomenon and all these populists, and they've changed prime minister three times in six months. Uh, in France, we still have democracy, but one of the risks is in 2027, Le Pen 
uh, is going to become a populist, uh, you know, in power. In the U.S., of course, you had the election of Donald Trump and his rage against uh, the elites and pretending to be a populist, caring about uh, white-collar workers. This is on the right. On the left, say, in Latin America, used to be the case that uh, maybe Argentina, Venezuela were the populist of the left. But look, the last two or three years, uh, populists of the left have come to power in Mexico, AMLO, in Peru, in Chile, in Colombia. In Brazil was the choice between a populist of the right, Bolsonaro, and one of the left, Lula. Luckily, it's Lula, because Bolsonaro is an authoritarian. They just tried an coup attempt against uh, Lula, the same way there was a coup attempt two years before in the US against the capital. And the biggest authoritarian of all, I don't know whether it's of the right or the left, is of course uh, Xi Jinping in China, who is not anymore Secretary General of the Party or President. He's not king, he's the emperor. He decides everything, doesn't have any more the collective leadership, and he can make big mistakes like authoritarian make, because authoritarians eventually make big mistakes. So we have this trend all over the world towards populism, towards authoritarianism, towards being aggressive towards other rivals outside of your country, that is leading also to social strife domestically, as you know, people are unhappy about income and wealth inequality and overall more or less. So yeah, in different ways, in different countries, this can lead to varieties of different forms of social strife, if not outright violence. Est-ce que vous pensez, est-ce que vous pensez que les, je, I let uh, you reput your plug, you've got it. Yes, just on your right shoulder. Yeah. Yes, you've got it. <laughs> je vais attendre que vous m'aidiez. Voilà, parfait. Est-ce est que vous pensez que d'ici les 6 à 12 prochains mois, les banques centrales vont retourner leur veste concernant l'augmentation des taux d'intérêt parce que la soutenabilité des dettes d'État vont devenir insoutenables. Est-ce que vous pensez qu'ils vont continuer ce phénomène de cavalerie financière ou ils vont serrer la vis jusqu'au bout Uh, well, there are two views about what uh, central banks are going to do. Uh, one view says that inflation has peaked, is falling, and because of that they can raise the rates more slowly. We'll have a mild recession, a short and shallow one, maybe a couple of quarters of negative economic growth. And as you have that recession, there'll be enough slack in labor and goods market, price and wage inflation is gonna fall. So by the middle of this year, the recession is over, inflation is lower, and central bank gonna start cutting policy rates and you gonna have a <clears throat> nice recovery of growth and recovery of the markets in the second half of the year. So first half difficult for the economy and the markets, Second half, good for economic growth and the markets. That's the conventional wisdom, the view of central banks, the view of most economists, the view of Wall Street and the city of London. Uh, I have a different view. My view is that inflation is gonna remain much higher uh, and is gonna fall, but not fall fast enough towards 2%. So the issue is not whether inflation has peaked, it has peaked, but going from 10% to 5-6 is easy. Going from 5-6 to 2, I think, is going to be hard. Commodity prices are going to be high, not just energy, but others, for many reasons. That's going to be inflationary. I think that the wage inflation is going to remain high for many reasons. Labor markets are tight. Unemployment is low aging of population, people retiring sooner, the great uh, resignation, reduction in the labor force, 
participation rate of many people, restriction to migration, labor strife and our workers saying our religions are falling, we're going to strike, we're going to fight for our rights. And the economic policies of the government are pro-labor, pro-union, pro-workers, pro-unemployed. Rightly so, because if you don't help them, there'll be a social strife. So you have a whole set of factors that imply not very high wage inflation, but say 5-6% that is consistent with inflation well above 2%. And in the service sector, the most important cost of production, of course, is labor. And therefore, if labor inflation is high, service inflation is going to remain high. So those factors imply inflation falling, but not towards 2%. Therefore, the ECB cannot stop rates only at 3%. If they want to fight inflation, they have to push them to 4 But if you go higher, two things happen. One, you have a hard landing of the real economy. The more you raise rates, the more you'll have a recession, and recession is slightly longer and more protracted than a short and shallow one. Secondly, as you increase interest rates, the borrowing cost for workers, households, businesses, corporation, government become higher. Cost of mortgages, cost of auto loans, credit cards, personal loans, business loans, corporate bonds, government bonds. Anyone who has a lot of debt, the interest is going to rise. Because for the last 20 years, the amount of debt relative to income was high, but we had low debt servicing costs because you had zero policy rates negative policy rates, what they call quantitative easing or credit easing, so long-term interest rates were low. Two years ago, $18 trillion equivalent of public debt in Europe and Japan had a negative interest rates, negative. Mortgages in Denmark had a negative yield. Some corporations could borrow to a negative yield. Because at that time, inflation was below 2%. We we're fighting low inflation with massive monetary and credit stimulus. Today, that part is over. As inflation has been rising, interest rates have to rise. And those firms, individuals, and government, I call them zombies, meaning insolvent. They have too much debt relative to their ability to pay. It. They're going to go bankrupt. And as you have a financial distress, that makes the recession worse. As the recession is worse and income are falling, revenues are falling, then the debt ratios become higher and become more unsustainable and you have more instability. So you'll have a vicious cycle between economic contraction and instability and financial contraction and instability. That's why you expect uh, not only inflation, not only recession and stagflation, but a stagflationary debt crisis, a combination of all these problems uh, together. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous expliquer ce qu'est un choc volcaire, le mécanisme du choc volcaire, et est-ce que vous pouvez expliquer à notre communauté les répercussions que ça pourrait avoir sur la population active Well, in the 1970s, there were two first oil shocks. One, spike in oil prices coming from the Yom Kippur War between Israel and Arab states, an embargo, oil prices tripled. You got the inflation, recession, stagflation. And then in 79, you had Iranian Revolution, another shock to supply of um, oil, another recession and stagflation. So inflation, expectation got out of control. There was a wage price spiral because every time these shocks did occur, the reaction of the central banks was not to raise interest rates to fight inflation enough. They were behind the curve and inflation got out of control. 
It was only in 79 that inflation became such a problem that Carter chose as the head of the Fed, Paul Volcker. And he said, do whatever it takes in order to fight inflation. He pushed interest rates to 20% because inflation was well above 10%. That led to a very severe recession in 1980-82, a double dip recession. And once that recession occurred, workers' wages started to fall. Firms did not have power to raise prices and he was able to break the back of inflation expectations and fight inflation and push it down to lower level. But it cost a lot of, in terms of a very severe recession for over two years, even that accent. Now, the problem today is as follows. Like the 1970s, we have negative supply shocks. The impact of COVID on production of goods, supply chains, supply of labor. The impact of the Russian invasion of Ukraine on commodity prices. The impact of the zero COVID policy of China until recently on global supply chains. But in the 1970s, we had inflation and stagflation, but we did not have a debt crisis in advanced economies because debt ratio, private and public, were low. 100% of GDP. Today are 420% of GDP, four times higher. After the global financial crisis, we had a debt problem. Too much debt of households, mortgages, and borrowing and lending by banks. But we had a demand shock, not a supply shock, a credit crunch. Collapse of demand implied deflation. And once we had deflation, we could ease monetary policy, fiscal policy, and credit to help the real economy. Because we had the problem of little inflation, not enough. Today, we have the worst of the 1970s, because we have the negative supply shocks, the stagflation, but we have four times as much debt as the 70s, and we are entering a recession, not cutting policy rates, but increasing them, because we have now inflation. So you have an inflation problem, you have a stagflation problem, and you have a debt problem, excessive debt as well. Now, if you're not willing to deal with the debt problem by raising taxes or cutting spending, the solution is the inflation tax. You monetize the deficit, you cause inflation, and inflation, when it's not expected, reduces the real value of nominal debt of long duration at fixed interest rates. The real value of that debt is reduced by inflation. Effectively, it's like a tax on capital, a tax on savers and creditors, and transferring money and income to debtors and borrowers by the inflation tax. That will be the solution to a debt problem. Effectively, we're gonna have higher inflation because we are a debt trap. There is so much debt in the system that if you raise interest rates enough to fight inflation, not only you cause a recession, you also cause a debt crisis. And faced with a risk of a economic and financial crash, central banks, they talk tough, hawkish, they're gonna wimp out, they're gonna blink, they're gonna become dovish because they cannot afford having a severe economic and financial crash. So we end up with higher levels of inflation on a more permanent basis. I think that's the outcome of it, the way you deal with it, is the path of least resistance from a political point of view. Qu'est-ce que vous pensez du fait que Ben Bernanke ait reçu l'équivalent du prix Nobel d'économie Est-ce que c'était l'équivalent no du prix Nobel d'économie pour Boomer Parce que Ben Bernanke a protégé les classes d'âge les plus âgées, les classes d'âge de rentier. Est-ce qu'il a reçu ce prix parce qu'il a sauvé l'économie mondiale Ou est-ce qu'il a simplement repoussé le problème sous le tapis 
Mais il s'est vu gratifier de ce prix parce que euh, c'est dans l'air du temps. Well, uh, he received the prize because he was a scholar of the Great Depression. And during the Great Depression, the stock market crash of 1039 became a depression because we allowed many farmers, many businesses, many banks, millions of them to collapse. Many of them were illiquid. They didn't have enough liquidity. They were not necessarily bankrupt. But by not providing them with support, monetary and credit, a problem of liquidity became a problem of insolvency. They went bankrupt. And something they started as a financial shock became a great depression. It was a collapse of demand, deflation and so on. So when the global financial crisis occurred, the lesson was we should do enough monetary, fiscal and credit easing to avoid this great recession from becoming Great Depression 2.0. And there is a logic to doing a backstop of some parts of the private and public sector. However, the buildup of debt has occurred from 100% of GDP in the 70s to 420 today is that every time there is a bubble, we don't stop it and people keep on overborrowing and the bubble leads to more debt and leverage. And then when the crash occurs, we say, oh my God, there is a systemic risk. There is going to be a financial crisis, a depression, and then we do easing. It makes then the borrowing cost cheap and leads to another cycle of borrowing even more. So we don't stop the bubble in the good times And then we try to protect people from the effects of a collapse of a bubble in bad times. And this asymmetric response implies more bubbles, more leverage, more debt, more risk taking in good times, and then bailing out everybody in bad times that causes a moral hazard, what people call moral hazard, that if you are protected and insured, you're going to take more risk than you should. So it leads to a bias of buildup of excessive debt. And uh, Ben Bernanke wrote papers on why we should not try to prick a bubble in good times. He says it's too dangerous. And he said, when the bubble becomes excessive and goes down, burst, then we have to protect the system from total collapse like the Great Depression. But not doing anything in good times and then dealing with the bubble exposed, create these biases towards more bubbles, more debt, more leverage. So that's his intellectual mistake. He learned well some lessons of the Great Depression, but he didn't learn the lessons of what it means to have too much debt, leverage, and loose monetary policy. Quel regard vous portez sur Christine Lagarde quand Christine Lagarde répond à un présentateur de télévision anglaise La question était quand est-ce que nous allons rembourser les dettes Et Christine Lagarde lui répond en temps voulu, en temps voulu. Est-ce que c'est parce qu'il n'y a pas de solution Est-ce que c'est pour ne pas créer la panique que Christine nous répond ce type de, de réponse est-ce que Christine marche sur le fil du rasoir Est-ce que Christine est une très bonne communicante Ou est-ce que Christine n'a rien dans les mains, comme on dit au poker Et que c'est du bluff pour maintenir le système calme um, well, First of all, I met her on many occasions. She is a very savvy policy maker. She has a lot of experience. She was a finance minister in France. She headed the International Monetary Fund, now the European Central Bank. She's not an economist by training, she's a lawyer, but she's learned a lot of economics and the connection between economics and policy and politics. So she's a high quality <clears throat> policy makers. Like every policy makers, uh, she's subject to constraint You know, policymakers are not stupid, they're not evil, they're not dumb, they don't want to cause damage. 
the problem the ECB is facing today is that uh, inflation went up a lot in the Eurozone, in part because of these negative supply shocks, but in part also because the monetary, fiscal and credit stimulus after COVID was too much, too much for too long. That was the policy mistake. However, right now, you have a dilemma. If you raise interest rates enough to fight inflation, you risk causing a recession and a severe recession. And if you don't increase interest rates enough to fight inflation, you risk having a de-anchoring of inflation and inflation expectations and a price and wage spiral that leads to high inflation like the 70s. So them if you do, them if you don't. But now there is an additional layer of uh, stress. As you increase interest rates, as I said, many governments in the Eurozone, some banks, some governments, some corporations, some households, some workers have a lot of debt. And as you raise interest rates, there is a risk that some of them go bankrupt, they become insolvent, and that financial crash damages the real economy, and a weaker real economy makes even more of a debt problem. So there is also a risk of financial instability. Now, the ECB now has created this new instrument, it's called TPI, Transmission Protection Instrument, that says that if the spread of any member of the Eurozone goes high too much, causing the risk of a debt problem for government, as long as the rise in the spread is due only to panic, to market dynamics, is not, is not justified by the economic fundamentals, then the ECB could go and buy the bonds of that country and prevent a disorderly crisis from occurring. However, in practice, the reason why the spreads of a country may rise is not just because people are irrational in the markets, but because maybe there is loose fiscal policy, uh, there is a lack of economic reforms. Look what happened in the United Kingdom when they had the fiscal stimulus and then they were punished by the markets with their spread rising and their currency falling in value. So the ECB can help countries that are doing the right thing, but they have just bad luck because of irrational investors. But if the reason why the spread goes up is because of their own policy mistakes, then the ECB would not be able to help them. And then you have a risk of a disorderly debt crisis. So that's another layer of complication in the decision making of the European Central Bank. It's not easy. Est-ce que la solution, ce ne serait pas de répudier la dette comme ce qui est écrit dans la Constitution américaine Est-ce que les États ne devraient pas répudier la dette et partir sur autre chose On entend beaucoup ça. Certains économistes, certains hommes politiques, certaines personnes disent « répudions la dette et voyons ». Qu'est-ce que vous pensez de cet argument de, répu de répudiation de la dette Well, whenever there is excessive debt, <clears throat> uh, there are potentially many solutions. Each one of them has benefits as some cost. Of course, the best solution to that problem is high economic growth, because the debt is a ratio within the level of the debt and some income. If your income rises, your debt becomes more sustainable. The debt to income ratio falls. Of course, that's wishful thinking, because when debt is high, growth becomes lower, and when growth is lower, the debt ratio becomes higher, so you end up in the vicious circle. Some people say, if your debt is too much, save, spend less, and, uh, and tighten your belt. At the individual level, that works. If I have too much debt and I spend less, I save more, I can reduce my debts. But if everybody in the economy spends less, saves more, that makes the recession worse, and as the recession is worse, income falls, and your debt to income ratio becomes higher. That's what Keynes called the paradox of thrift, 
the paradox of saving. What is individually rational, collectively may be actually the wrong response. Now, if you borrow in a foreign currency and you have too much debt, you have no choice but to default and then to restructure your debt, negotiate a reduction of your debt. That's what emerging markets do. The difference is, however, that in advanced economies like US and Europe that borrow in their own currencies, you can reduce the real value of your nominal debt by having a surprise inflation, because inflation implies that your borrowing costs in real terms are reduced and the real value of your debt is lower. So unexpected inflation is a form of default. You're still taxing savers and creditors and transferring well to the debtor and borrowers, but it's not done through formal default is done through the inflation tax. Another solution can be financial repression. You force the banks to hold your debt of the government, and if the demand for it is high, the interest rate is lower, but it's a tax on the financial system. Another solution is you tax the wealthy, you have a wealth taxation, you expropriate their wealth, and then you use it to pay down your debt. But that's, again, a form of taxing the creditors and the savers and transferring money to the borrowers. So they're all variants of the same. Default, monetization, inflation, capital taxation, expropriation, financial repression, outright default and restructuring. There are variants of the same idea when there's too much debt. So you have to choose your poison, figure out which one of them is uh, less damaging, and it depends on many different variables. On va essayer de poser une colle à notre euh, interprète préféré. Est-ce que vous connaissez la, connaissez la mitidratisation Uh, no, can you explain it in English? Ah, ok, uh, c'était une colle. Uh, ok, je, je vais poser une autre question. Well, I'm not sure if taking a little bit of poison every day it uh, protects you against uh, the poison, makes you more immune, or is a small, uh, a slow death. I think it probably is more the latter rather than the former one. It's like boiling a frog uh, slowly. You boil it slowly, but eventually you kill the frog with a slow motion death. Quand vous avez vu Janet Yellen s'excuser publiquement du fait qu'elle n'ait pas vu l'inflation venir, ça vous a fait rire? Ça vous a, vous avez pas été surpris de, le, de son incapacité à, à prévoir l'inflation Qu'est-ce que ça, qu'est-ce que, qu'est-ce que vous en avez pensé Well, it was not just Janet Yellen, uh, the Fed, the ECB, pretty much all advanced economies, policymakers did not see this inflation coming. On one side, they they made a mistake. On the other side, also, many economists and Wall Street made the same mistake. Because for 20 years, the problem in advanced economy was not high inflation, was that we had a target of 2% and inflation was below 2%, sometimes close to zero. After the global financial crisis, deflation. At the beginning of the COVID crisis, also had deflation because the fall in demand was greater than the fall in supply. And during the global financial crisis, we didn't have enough monetary and fiscal stimulus, and the recovery was anemic. Growth picked up, but very slowly. The unemployment rate remained high and fell only slowly. So when the COVID shock occurred, everybody, whether on the right or on the left, said, We made a mistake during the global financial crisis. 
we didn't have enough monetary and fiscal and credit stimulus. This time around, since the shock looks bigger, let's do a massive stimulus. The problem was that, uh, one, the stimulus was an order of magnitude, three, four times more as a share of GDP than what they did 10 years before. Secondly, the global financial crisis was a severe crisis that lasted uh, two or three years, while the COVID shock in terms of recession was from February of 2020 until May, June. It was a very short and shallow recession, lasted barely maximum two quarters, and with the reopening of the economy, as we flattened the curve, and with the massive fiscal, monetary, and credit stimulus, the economy started to recover fast. So the stimulus became, one, too much, too long, and excessive on one side. Secondly, in the short run, demand fell more than supply, but then demand recovered given the stimulus. But people did not realize because they had not seen negative supply shocks since the 70s, that COVID was also a negative supply shock, reducing the production of goods and services, reducing the supply of labor, creating bottlenecks in global supply chains. This was the first shock. And then in 2022, last year, you had another negative supply shock that surprised policymakers, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that increased oil prices, natural gas, food, fertilizers, and industrial metals. And three, there was another third negative supply shock. That was the zero <coughs> COVID policy of China. The shut down production in China and created additional global supply bottlenecks. So inflation got out of control because of a combination of bad policies, loose monitoring, fiscal and credit easing, but also bad luck, at least three negative aggregate supply shocks. So policymakers made mistakes, but you have to also try to figure out why they made those mistakes. Est-ce que vous pensez qu'il y a de l'éthique sur les marchés financiers Est-ce que vous ne pensez pas que les marchés financiers sont devenus incontrôlables avec des gens euh, mégalomanes, euh, corrompus, euh, vénaux, euh, aux mains de... où le, leur seul objectif, c'est de faire de l'argent à tout prix pour se prendre des stock options, se prendre des dividendes, se prendre des, des bonus, au détriment euh, de la population réellement travaillante. Est-ce que les marchés financiers, il y a de l'éthique Et est-ce que les marchés financiers sont réellement là pour financer l'économie réelle Les um, well, financial markets ont deux fonctions positives de prendre des savings et de les them à the right investment projects, financing things that are useful, like uh, mortgages so you can buy a home, or various types of personal loans to smooth uh, shocks to your income, or give business loans that allow businesses to grow. But like everything else, uh, if that borrowing uh, becomes excessive, if the credit uh, criteria and standards become loose, if you allow too much debt and too much leverage and too much risk taking, then you're feeding a bubble because people borrow money to buy assets. The value of assets goes higher. Then they can use those assets as a collateral to borrow more. And you enter into a credit and an asset bubble in which then people become arrogant, become risk taking, there is fraud and all of these eventually leads to a boom and a bubble, and then eventually a bust and a crash. And you're right, uh, human beings are always going to be greedy, some of them, especially in financial markets. But it's not just financial market. Today, uh, in the last few years, uh, a young generation of uh, young uh, Gen Zs, hopeless, skillless, jobless, incomeless, they do day trading. They buy Mimi stocks. They buy crypto, believing they can become rich overnight. No one has become rich overnight. One 
person maybe out of a million, everybody else loses their money. So it's not just a small group of Wall Street speculators and greedy people that are the trouble. Now it's become across the board. Everybody's gambling with money and having this type of delusion. Of course, the job of monetary policy, the job of supervisors and regulators of the financial system would be to stop the bubble before it becomes excessive. You can do it by raising interest rates. You can do it by credit controls. You by, can do it by limiting leverage and a whole range of prudential policies of avoiding excessive credit bubbles that cause asset bubbles. The trouble is that in good times, implementing these uh, policies is hard. The politician and the borrowers complain and say, hey, you're not letting me invest to borrow, and I'm doing it for good reasons. And uh, the regulators often are captured by Wall Street and by industry. Sometimes the politicians are corrupt. And whenever there's a bubble, we find some story on why there is a major new revolution in technology, uh, the internet, the railroads, crypto, whatever, that justifies investing and leveraging the bubble. And of course, those are fantasies, and they end up in tears. But in the meanwhile, the bubble gets out of control until it goes bust, and then the next one comes. So these are cycles that in principle we control, we could control with tight money, high interest rates, capital controls, credit controls, prudential regulation, supervision of banks, shadow banks, financial system, reducing toxic derivatives, reducing toxic financialization, and so on and so on, but we don't do it. So we go through these cycles over and over again. On risque, des, on risque de voir la fin bientôt quand même. Quel regard vous, vous portez sur les cryptos Les crypto-monnaies, quel regard vous portez sur les derniers scandales de, de, de crypto-monnaies Est-ce que certains ont raison de dire que c'est la solution pour que les politiciens arrêtent de faire de la dette, pour faire de la subornation de vote Est-ce que les cryptos, vous y croyez Est-ce que les cryptos d'État vous y croyez, adossé sur des matières premières réelles Yeah, I've been personally uh, skeptic of uh, cryptocurrencies and a critic of them already starting in 2016-17. And I kept my view that were most of them a scam, a Ponzi game, criminal fraud, a bubble that's going to eventually burst. And look at the last year alone. In the last uh, 12 months, uh, even Bitcoin lost 80% of its value, going from 69,000 to 16. Ethereum has lost more than 80%. The other top 10 of them lost between 80% to 90%. And of course, tens of thousands of uh, these uh, ICOs, initial coin offerings, were a scam to begin with. People stealing the money to buy cars, Lamborghini, villas, boats, planes in the Caribbean, Miami, literally scam and criminal behavior. 99% of it is this way. Secondly, calling them cryptocurrencies is a, is a misnomer. They're not money, they're not currency. They're, they're not a unit of account because nothing is priced in Bitcoin. They're not a scalable means of payment because with Bitcoin you can do seven transactions per second. With the Visa network you can do 50,000 transactions per second. They're not a stable store of value because the value of uh, Bitcoin can go up or down 10, 20% overnight. That's why Even the crypto conferences don't accept uh, payment of their fees in Bitcoin because the entire profit margin of the conference can be wiped out overnight. And finally, 
they are not a single numerator. Single numerator means that I need a unit of count so I can compare the price of bread as opposed to the price of, uh, of uh, meat, the relative price between two. So you need a single numerator. In a world of tokenization, where there are thousands of tokens, if I need a Pepsi token to buy Pepsi Cola and a Coca token to buy Coca Cola, I cannot tell anymore even the relative price between Coca Cola and Pepsi, between bread and meat. It's like going back to literally to barter. Even, even the Flintstones, you know, the cartoon story about Stone Age people, they're the more advanced monetary system than crypto because they're the single numerator. They're using shell, the shell where the unit of account so you can tell the price of bread versus the price of meat. In crypto, you're back to barter. So calling them currencies, money, they're not. Doesn't make any sense. They're not even assets. Usually an asset has some income. Stocks give you dividends. Bonds give you coupon payments. Bonds give interest on it. Uh, a business loan, a bank loan gives you interest. Real estate gives you rent. Or you have the rental service of owning your home. Commodities, oil, energy, food, give you the services of that. These guys don't have any income. Now, gold doesn't have income, but it had uh, utility, jewelry, and uses industry, like gold, uh, silver are used for production of various types of goods and services. Take Bitcoin, doesn't have income, doesn't have any use in industry, doesn't have any utility, Nobody's wearing uh, Bitcoin jewelry. Actually, some tacky people wear them, but they're really ugly. There's not going to be Bitcoin jewelry becoming popular. And therefore, you cannot even value Bitcoin because you need a stream either of income or a stream of use or a stream utility that you can do to do the discounted value of it so you can price the value of an asset. So it's impossible to price these things. That's why some people say Bitcoin is going to be a million and other people say it's going to be zero. My view is the fundamental value of Bitcoin is zero. Zero. Actually, it's negative. It's not zero. Because Bitcoin has a huge negative environmental externality, uses so much energy to produce it, more than the Netherlands or Argentina, that if there was the right carbon tax on Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin wouldn't be zero, it would be negative, given the carbon tax to deal with the externality of Bitcoin. So they're not currencies, they're not assets, they are scams, bunch of crooks, criminals, fraudsters, tax evaders, terrorists, and other people doing illegal activities like human trafficking are using them. That's the only use of it for illegal activities. So they're a total scam, total criminality. And SBF, SBF, the head of FTX, is not the exception, is the rule. They're all scam, they're all Ponzi games, and they're all criminal and crooks. They should all end up in jail. They are not all criminals. Almost all of them, Almost. frankly. Uh, J'ai une question concernant... Je vais vous poser une question Internet, d'ailleurs. Une question de l'ours. Aujourd'hui, quel est le marché le plus risqué aux États-Unis L'immobilier ou les crédits à la consommation Je pense que les deux choses sont en fait correlées. Because uh, what happened in the US in Anglo-Saxon country was that for a long time, the income of people were not rising enough compared to their own demand expectation of spending and consumption. 
as they say, Americans could not keep up with the Joneses. Every family were comparing themselves with their neighbors and say, they look richer, they have the auto, they have a bigger car, home, whatever. So what was the solution that was given in the Anglo-Saxon country? It's what we call democratization of finance. I let you to have many credit cards. I let you to borrow to buy your uh, car. I let you borrow to, for your student loan. I let you borrow as much as you want to buy a home and put very little equity. And as the value of your home goes higher, because everybody's borrowing, then you can borrow even more. It's what's called uh, home equity withdrawal. The value of your home is higher, let me take a loan against the higher value so I can spend more than my income because your income was not sufficient to finance all your spending. So you effectively use your uh, home like a, a ATM machine and borrowing against it and afford the lifestyle you couldn't afford it. So the mortgage problem and the consumption problem are two sides of the same problem that you're using your home as an ATM machine, you borrow against it to finance consumption above your income. So the mortgage bubble was also a consumption bubble. And when the mortgage bubble went bust, the consumption bubble goes bust. So, and the fundamental problem is there is income and wealth inequality. Real income are not rising enough. The cost of education, of healthcare, of pensions, of buying a home, of services is rising and people are desperate. And when they are desperate, they finance their excess consumption compared to their income by borrowing and you have a debt bubble. And you make money cheap, they borrow even more until the bubble burst. Qu'est-ce que vous pensez du protectionnisme économique? Well, uh, I'm in principle, in favor of uh, free trade, of globalization, of migration of capital, of labor, of more trading goods in services, uh, in data information technology. The country that integrated globally have done well. Suppose you were taking all the 27 or 28 countries of the European Union. If there had not been the European Union, there'd be small economies, small markets, and they would not be able to grow as fast as having foreign markets within Europe or globally. So most countries in Europe and the Eurozone have been actually benefiting from globalization. Look at China or India. They were so poor and they started becoming less poor when they opened up to the global economy and they joined the global markets, the global labor supply. Look at example. North Korea and South Korea. At the time of the Korean War, the North was much richer than the South. They had the natural resources, they had the manufacturing. Korea didn't have anything. But Korea invested in their human capital, education, skills, and now is an advanced economy, while people are still starving in uh, North Korea, that is an autarchic country. Of course, however, trade, globalization, migration, leads to winners and losers. If you are a low value added blue collar worker in advanced economies, in a labor intensive uh, sector of the economy, manufacturing, light, then your jobs and your income can be threatened by cheap goods coming from China or other emerging markets. But that's the natural churn of an economic uh, system and of course, we should have helped those who lost their jobs by giving them retraining, education, so they could go into other jobs. But we failed. We have trade creates enough economic gains that you can tax those that are winners, transfer income or skills to those who are left behind, and you can still make everybody better off. But we didn't do that. The winners got more of the share of the benefits while those who were losers or left behind were never helped. And that was the beginning of the backlash by blue collar workers and others against trade and globalization and migration and so on. So in principle, globalization is a good idea, 
but you have to deal with the distributional effects of trade. Otherwise, you can make a good chunk of your country worse off rather than better off. On a vu récemment euh, Exxon être exposé dans la presse pour montrer sa préconnaissance ou son anticipation du réchauffement climatique depuis 1970 environ. Vous avez suivi cette, euh, cette histoire-là à peu près yeah, yeah. Euh, Est-ce qu'on va voir euh, les grands énergéticiens, les grands pétroliers se faire attaquer comme les, les industries du tabac par des class action et est-ce que les répercussions sur le prix de l'action de ces mêmes énergéticiens auront des, des conséquences, par exemple, dans le portefeuille de certains fonds de pension censés garantir la retraite des fonctionnaires américains Quelles quelle auraient les répercussions de la dévaluation massive due à des, des class action contre les énergéticiens Et quelles, quelles auraient le, les répercussions de ces baisses de prix de ces dévaluations d'actifs dans le portefeuille de certains fonds de pension américains. Yes, there is a possibility that there be class action lawsuits against energy companies in the same way there were similar kind of lawsuits against the tobacco companies. That's a potential threat to some of their profits and their earnings. Uh, but I would say that um, we don't know yet whether those losses will be successful and what the, the fees that they have to pay will be, or fines. And I would say in the short run, what the oil company worry more about is that uh, since uh, energy prices are high, the profits of these oil company have risen very sharply. And now in many countries, uh, there is this view that we should tax them these extraordinary profits because uh, they're excessive and we should use the taxation of those profits to transfer income to households or businesses that are hurt by high energy prices. Now, there is a logic to trying to tax these super profits that are abnormal. That's the argument for it. But then the counter argument is that in a world in which uh, energy prices are high because there is not enough uh, supply of energy, if you tax them and already all companies are under investing into new production of fossil fuels, they may produce even less and then the supply constraint becomes higher and then the cost of energy could also become higher. So finding the right response is not so simple. It's easy to blame big oil, you're rich, you make all this money, let me tax your way. Then you have to think about the, the consequence of it. For example, I'm all in favor of dealing with global climate change. And because we worry about the emissions coming from fossil fuels, we're bashing big oil. And we're telling shareholders, stakeholders, tell your companies to underinvest into fossil fuels and going to renewable. And we're telling the banks, try to not fund big oil company if they don't invest into renewable. Now, all that pressure, shareholders, stakeholders, governments, social society, banks, implies that for the last uh, five to 10 years, big oil companies, especially the private ones, have under-invested into new capacity of new fields of fossil fuels. So the supply of fossil fuels is falling, but the supply of renewable energy is not rising fast enough to compensate for the fall in the supply and capacity of fossil fuel. So now we have a structural lack of supply of energy. So even, beef, even before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Brent, that is an index of all prices, was close to $100 per barrel, even before. So it was not just the Russian invasion of Ukraine that caused the spike in all prices. In part, it was also this underinvestment in fossil fuel capacity because of bashing 
and going after big oil. So those are some of the side effects of well-intended policies that have unintended consequences. Vous connaissez la COP. Voir un, un président de la COP issu du monde du pétrole, c'est normal, c'est pas normal pour l'année prochaine. Ça, ça, c'est une bonne initiative. C'est un message passé aux producteurs de pétrole. Qu'est-ce que c'est You know, both COP in Glasgow and COP in Sharm el Sheikh were were a failure. And not only because the heads of some uh, oil company may have too much influence, because most corporations, not just oil company, they do these net zero plans, but their net zero plans are written by their uh, communication and PR departments. They're not written by the managers or the scientists. So everybody has to pretend that 20 years from now, we're going to go to zero. They write a white paper, there's no substance, but this way, They save their face, and of course they do a little cosmetic here and there to save uh, energy and on reducing their carbon footprint. But as I said, it's all greenwashing, it's all green wishing. So even if all the commitments of the last two COPs were to be made, and that's a big if, because neither US nor Europe nor emerging markets are going to do what they said, but even with the current commitments, We're going to go to a rise in temperatures that is not 1.5, is not 2 degrees. Its current level, we are towards a trajectory of 2.4. Even if we do everything we promised, and since we're not going to do everything we promised, the number by the end of this century may be plus 3. 1.5 is bad, 2 is ugly, 3 is a disaster. We are on the way towards plus three. Let's be realistic about it. And everybody is greenwashing. Qu'est-ce que vous pensez du forum de Davos? You know, the Davos Forum, and I've uh, gone there many years, not every year, is one of the many forums, and there are tons of other ones where global leaders get together and they discuss uh, global economic issues. Now, do they resolve problems? No. But other forum, any conference in the world, you talk, you debate stuff, you try to figure out solutions, but these are not forum of taking decisions. The decisions are taken at the national level or international level in other types of fora, like IMF, World Bank, UN, and so on. On net, in my view, having people get together and talk to each other rather than making war to each other is a good idea. Is a good idea. Having global leaders, economic, political, religious, cultural, and so on, is a good idea. And of course, over the next few, last few decades, the WEF has been sensitive to the fact that there are social issues. So there are social entrepreneurs and there are leaders of uh, various types of environmental organizations and others who care about labor rights and so on. So they try to be more representative of a broader spectrum of views on all of these issues. So it's a good forum. There are plenty of other ones that are as good where people get together and discuss. It's more of a talk shop rather than an action shop. Uh, is useful, but I don't believe that any individual alone, any forum, any organization can resolve uh, global problems. Uh, you know, on the uh, global pandemic, the World Health Organization, the WHO, did not succeed. On issues of trade, we're going towards protectionism, deglobalization, And the WTO, the World Trade Organization, has limited powers. The UN has limited powers in enforcing global security. The IMF and the World Bank do a good job, but they have limited powers. So we don't have yet 
institutions of global governance that are powerful enough to enforce global decision making, global rules. And if anything, there's now a backlash against globalization, against globalists, against uh, supranational organization, because they claim they don't have democratic legitimacy, they take away national sovereignty. But you know, we live in a world where the problems are global, climate change, pandemic, economic security, financial security, global military security, impact of AI, climate change, and you name it. So for global problems, you need global governance. We need more global governance, not less. And unfortunately, now there is a more of a nationalistic backlash. I want to protect my country, my workers, my firms. And if you do that, you go towards protectionism. But you know, my taxes on uh, your exports that are my import reduce your exports. But if you retaliate against me, your tariffs reduce my exports to you. And if you start a war of retaliation, increasing import tax on both sides, everybody is worse off and we have a worse world rather than a better world. So of course, globalization and trade has some cost. We have to deal with them. Growth has to be sustainable, has to be inclusive, has to deal with inequality, but trade protectionism is not the right solution. Je vais vous lire une question d'Internet que je vois passer sous mes yeux. On a commencé à y répondre, mais je vais vous la lire quand même. Est-ce qu'il est possible d'estimer les risques du changement climatique, entre parenthèses, eau, perte de biodiversité, maladie, fermez la parenthèse, sur l'économie globale Si c'est le cas, n'est-ce pas un argument suffisant pour convaincre n'importe quel économiste de changer de paradigme well, some of the cost, uh from climate change uh, are the loss of uh, almost half of animal and uh, 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 plants in the planet uh, because we have this anthropomorphic view where everything is centered around human and sapiens and we don't care as much about the welfare of animal and plants. We don't vote, we don't have a say. Of course, damaging the planet destroying the plants and the animals, it has a number of side effects that are cost even to human beings. And destroying the planet creates damage. Hurricanes, rising sea levels, droughts, floods, wildfires that have a huge economic cost even for the humans, let alone for the animals. But as I pointed out before, doing something about global climate change is subject to a huge range of political, domestic and international constraints that prevents us from doing uh, the right thing. Est-ce que vous voulez qu'on aborde un point spécifique que vous avez euh, écrit dans votre livre Mega Menace Est-ce que vous avez un point en particulier que vous voulez faire passer à, à, à notre communauté Well, the big picture point I want to highlight is the following one. We have had 75 years of relative peace, progress, and prosperity, say after 1945. And we think that the future is going to be like the near past. And we project it this way. However, I think that's a mistake for a number of reasons. First of all, even in those 75 years, the period between 1945 and until the early 1980s was very different from the last 20 years. And I'll give you the following description. I'm old enough, you're younger than me. I'm 64, was born in the 50s, and I grew up 60s, 70s, early 80s between Middle East and Europe until I came to the US. Now, when I grew up, I never worried about war among great powers and nuclear winter. The taunt, Nixon to China, very little. I never worried about climate change. Temperatures were barely above pre-industrial level. 
I never worried about pandemics, never even heard about them. Last one was 1918, Spanish flu. I never worried about AI destroying most jobs. There was no AI. Yeah, there was AI, old theory, AI winter. I never worried about uh, deglobalization and protectionism with integration of Europe, NAFTA, GATT, WTO. We even had hyper-globalization with China, Russia, India, emerging markets, joining the global markets. I never worried about debt crisis. Debt ratio, private and public were low. Growth was high, so there was no debt crisis. I never worried about implicit debt, unfunded debt coming from aging of population. Lots of young people workers and their taxes paying for the benefits for a smaller number of elderly. Today is the opposite. I never worried about depression. Yeah, there were economic cycles, some recessions, they were mild. In the 70s, yes, we had stagflation, but it was followed by 30 years of great moderation. We didn't have really big financial crises, boom, bubble, bust, and crash. It was regulation supervision of the banks, capital controls, financial repression, and we didn't have the toxic leverage, financialization, derivatives we have today. Economic cycles were stable, financial cycles were stable. And finally, we used to live in liberal democracies. Yeah, there were center-right, center-left disagreeing, but not the kind of extreme polarization, partisanship that you have between extreme populist party of the extreme right or left now becoming more popular, coming to power. So this is the world I lived. You fast forward to today, we have a risk of war among global powers and a nuclear war, not just a conventional war. Climate change is a disaster. Pandemics are occurring more frequently. Why? Why there was none between 1918 and 1980s? Now we have HIV AIDS, MERS, SARS, swine flu, bird flu, Zika, Ebola, COVID-19. And it's only a matter of time. Because as we destroy the animal ecosystem, those animals that carry the pathogens, pangolin bats, get closer to livestock and humans. And then the zoonotic transmission from animal to human becomes more frequent. So there'll be even worse pandemic in the future. Now we have the risk of AI destroying most jobs, increasing inequality, permanent uh, unemployment is technological. We have deglobalization and protectionism. We have bigger economic cycles. We have private and public debt explosive, implicit debt coming from aging explosive. And now authoritarian populists of right and left are coming to power. So the last 20 years have been showing the emergence of these mega threats that did not even exist in the golden 30, 40 years between 1945 and the early 80s. Additional point, the period before 1945, we had 30 years, they look like today. In spite of the first industrialization, in spite of the first era of globalization, we did not prevent World War I. And after World War I, we had the Spanish flu. Then we had the stock market crash of 29. Then we had the beginning of the Great Depression. Then we had inflation, hyperinflation, deflation, trade wars, currency wars, financial crisis, debt crisis, defaults, unemployment 25%, economic meltdown. And then the Nazis with Hitler came to power in uh, Germany, the fascists with Mussolini came to power in Italy, Franco came to power in Spain, and the military uh, aggressive came power in Japan. And then we had the World War II, and then we had the Holocaust. And only after that, we created the institutions that gave us relative peace and prosperity for a period of time, and now we're mega threats. However, as bad as the ugly 30 years between 1914 and 1945 were, there are four mega threats that did not exist then and exist today. At that time, you didn't have to worry about climate change, right? It was not an issue. 
he didn't worry about AI destroying jobs. There was not even a computer, let alone AI. He didn't have to worry about implicit debt of governments because social security system pensions had been barely created and most people were dying before they were getting their first pension check. And as ugly as World War I and World War II were, they were mostly conventional wars. It was only at the end of World War II that luckily it was the US rather than Nazi Germany who got the bomb. And then the Americans used the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki to stop and end World War II. This time around, if there was a conflict between great powers, that war is not gonna be unconventional. Uncon it's gonna start conventional and it's gonna become rapidly unconventional. So the risk of a war that becomes a nuclear winter for the entire humanity is a new risk. So compared to the 30s and the 40s, today the things are having mega threats that did not even exist in those 30 years that were ugly and nasty. So we cannot take progress for granted. We cannot assume that the future is gonna be near past. We are living like zombies. We are sleepwalking into disaster. We push the snooze button. We are not addressing this problem. They're getting worse day by day. They're all interconnected each other. And unless we change it, this is not just the end of our incomes, of our jobs, or saving our health. Could be the end of the planet, could be the end of humanity, could be the destruction of our own species. That is a risk we're facing today. I'm not saying it's gonna happen, but we have to be aware of the problem, start to address it individually, collectively, national level, international level, and the time to act is now. We wasted time, the time to act is now. If we don't, we're gonna face dystopia, instability, chaos, and disaster. That's my main message. Psychologiquement parlant, comment c'est une question plus personnelle que je vais vous poser, vous n'êtes pas obligé d'y répondre. Quand vous faites un, une prospective autour de toutes ces menaces, psychologiquement parlant, qu'est-ce que ça crée chez vous Est-ce que vous dormez bien Est-ce que ça vous hante de voir la passivité intellectuelle des gens, des politiques, des marchés financiers, des économistes, de tout ce que vous voulez. Comment vous gérez cette pression à force d'avoir autant de connaissances On dit souvent « heureux les simples d'esprit », aujourd'hui j'ai compris. Comment vous vous sentez, vous, personnellement, par rapport à toutes ces méga-menaces You know, when COVID occurs... Many people I knew, even friends, escaped New York. I live in New York. They went to Miami. They went to the Hamptons. They went to upstate. I spent all of COVID, literally every single day, in New York. I never even went once to Miami or to the Hamptons for three years until it ended. Because, you know, there was uh, lockdowns. I could have gotten sick, I could have ended up in hospital, I could have died. And then there were demonstrations, BLM, rightly so. There was even violence, there was riots, there was even lootings. Most of the shops in my neighborhood were being boarded up because they were looting and breaking them and so on. I didn't escape. You have to face the reality you're in. If there was another global pandemics, New York is going to be ground zero of it because globalization, lots of people coming in, of course, was a ground zero. It's going to happen again. If there was a nuclear war, the first nuclear weapon go to New York, Washington, Beijing, and Moscow. Everybody in New York is going to die. Uh, climate change is increasing sea level rising. Most of Manhattan is going to be underwater. Hurricane Sandy destroyed the good chunk of Manhattan. There'll be other hurricanes. But you know, you cannot escape in a cave upstate. You cannot go and buy a piece of land in New Zealand hoping they're gonna avoid this mess because it's gonna hit you one way or another. Plus, if most humanity is destroyed, do you want to live? I'd rather to live my life, be in New York, being engaged socially, politically, and try to resolve this problem, hoping they don't happen. Because if it does happen, I'd rather not live. 
I'd rather die like everybody else rather to escape somewhere else. So the reality is that the way to deal with these things is to be engaged, to talk about them, to take action, and to live your life as it is rather than trying to live in a dreamland where it's not a dream, it's going to become a nightmare, and you cannot escape from reality. And by the way, during COVID, since before COVID, I was spending half of my time traveling around the world. I didn't have time for my friends. During COVID, I learned to cook. And every Friday night, I had Shabbat dinner. And we have a nice conversation, Jeffersonia, where we discuss some important topic, we have a common conversation. And all the musicians in New York during COVID could not play live, so my home was on a few places with live music and jam session. So we created, you know, Shabbat dinner and community and kindred spirits and friends who actually survive and thrive during COVID. We didn't escape the city and we created a community. So the silver lining of COVID was better human relationship, better friendship, better sense of community, less sense of anonymity. Some people became more anonymous, more lonely. I created my friends' community. So even at the personal level, became an occasion for growth and becoming more compassionate and more caring and more aware. Vos proches, vos amis, euh, quand on vous a décrit comme le docteur Doom, celui qui voyait tout en noir, celui qui a, pr qui a prédit les 15 dernières euh, crises, alors qu'il y en avait 10, c'est comme ça que certains économistes français vous qualifient. Nouriel Roubini, c'est celui qui anticipe 10 crises sur 5. Euh, quand vos amis prennent conscience que vous aviez raison, vous avez raison, est-ce qu'ils se mettent en catatonie émotionnelle, en catatonie intellectuelle Ou est-ce qu'ils en demandent plus quel, quel effet ça a sur eux de, de prendre conscience des choses You know, first of all, I always say I'm not Dr. Doom. I'm not always more pessimistic. Actually, the two major events in the last decade where I was much more optimistic than consensus. In 2025, 15, sorry, 15, uh, the consensus on Wall Street was that the Grexit will occur, Greek exit from the Eurozone. All of Wall Street, Goldman Sachs, City, their baseline was Grexit. I spent many months going to Brussels, Berlin, Rome, Athens, Paris. I talked to all the policymakers. And I realized in that game of chicken between Greece and the Troika, Greece did not have a good hand and they would have to blink. And I realized that a $200 billion bailout of Greece was the carrot in addition to the sticks of austerity reform that will lead them to then stay in the Eurozone. And I realized that uh, geopolitically, while the Minister of Treasury of Germany, Schauble, wanted Greece to go. Angela Merkel realized this was the year of the Syrian crisis and the refugees, that if Greece had left the Eurozone, then all these refugees could come from Turkey to Greece to Europe. So it was also a political reason for keeping Greece in the Eurozone. And when I contacted all those dots, I said, Grexit will not occur. When everybody else believed Grexit will occur, and then a domino effect will lead to the rest of the Eurozone collapse. Same thing happened uh, a year later. People were worried uh, in Davos, January and February of 2016, of a hard landing of China. It started in August, September of 15. Then it became worse in January, February of 16. Stock market crash. Every thought, oh my God, Chinese market are crashing. Stock market US is crashing more than 20% repeat of the global financial crisis, hard landing of China. And everybody in Davos was asking me, is going to be the hard landing of China a repeat of the global financial crisis? I said, no, China is not going to have a soft landing. It's not going to have a hard landing. It's going to be bumpy. They have the resources to backstop the system and try to control the crisis. It's not going to be another financial crisis. So on the two major events of the last decade where the consensus was Grexit, collapse of the Eurozone, and collapse of China, another global meltdown, I said the opposite. I was much more optimistic than consensus. Additionally, when I speak about the themes of my book today, 
I'm not talking about aliens coming from Mars, taking over the Earth. I'm not talking about asteroids hitting the planet. I'm talking about threats that everybody recognizes. Hundreds of books on climate change, on geopolitical depression, about pandemics, about financial threats, about uh, deglobalization. All of these things are actually reasonably obvious. What I do, value added, I connect the dots. You know, I call them mega threats. Other people call it polycrisis. The head of the IMF calls it confluence of calamities. Yesterday, the uh, WEF did their global risk report, same idea, connection of all these different crises that I discuss. So the ideas are there. I connect the dots and I look at, from an economic point of view, at what are the costs of all these mega threats and how each one of these economic factors affects these mega threats and how they're connected to each other. But I'm not speaking about science fiction. This is not science fiction at all. These are threats that everybody agrees exist. Then some people say some are more risky, some are less risky, some are going to happen in the far future, some of them are policy solutions that are more likely rather than less likely. We can agree or disagree to the extent of it, but I've not heard anybody saying that none of these mega threats exist. All of them do exist. The question is how severe they are and can we wake up and can we address them before it's too late? That's the only question that is matter of debate. Dernière question Internet. Euh, que pense-t-il de la scission de l'humanité entre l'hyperclasse et le reste Un peu comme dans le film Elyséum. Um, we have seen, for the last few decades, an increase in income and wealth inequalities between haves and have not, those who go ahead and those who are left behind. It's happening in advanced economies, especially Anglo-Saxons, but it's happening also in China, in India, and emerging markets. And some of the backlash against liberal democracy comes from this rise in income and wealth inequality. It's dangerous because when there is excessive inequality, it leads to social strife, to violence, to civil wars, sometimes to revolution, or to the rise to power of extremist populists of the right and the left that are not even able to reduce that inequality. So I think that uh, these divisions are dangerous and eventually lead to either domestic or external violence. So the rise in income and wealth inequality is one of the threats that we have to address. The unfortunate problem is that usually policies of taxation of the wealthy, redistribution to the poor, do not significantly reduce inequality. Historically, inequality has been only reduced when you have revolution, wars, famines, pestilence. But that's one in which even the rich die or get sick or lose their wealth. It's not the best way of reducing inequality. So the question we have to ask ourselves, Are there policies that are progressive that can reduce inequality before violence reduces inequality? I'm not sure we have the right answer for that. Est-ce que l'évasion fiscale est une méga menace? N'y a-t-il pas un risque de guerre civile? Uh, tax evasion alone is not a mega threat, but tax evasion, tax avoidance is one of the many reasons why inequality is rising. It's rising because of trade, because of globalization, because of migration, because of technological innovation that is capital intensive, skill bias, labor saving, but it's also because the elites have economic, political, financial power. They change the regulations, they change the tax laws to their favor. Capital is more mobile than labor, and capital can move to offshore financial centers that don't uh, tax properly or allow some corporation, some rich individuals to avoid the taxes or to do across-the-board tax evasion. So that's, that's a problem. 
Je voudrais avoir trois livres qui ont été importants dans votre vie. <coughs> well, uh, I'm not a religious Jew, I'm secular, but I think that, you know, the, the Bible, especially the Old Testament, is still a great book. Uh, there are lots of actually, uh, especially Genesis, stories of humanity, of tragedy. Some people say lots of violence, sex, incest, and, <laughs> and other types of uh, drama that is human. But there is a, about moral values as well, and how you create a nation, and how you create a better humanity. So even a secular person, I think, can find uh, the Old Testament as something worth reading. Uh, secondly, you know, when I was growing up, I would read a lot of literature, especially in high school, great European literatures, not just Italian or German, but even French, and uh, all the great novels of, uh, of say, even French literature, one that really was one of my favorite was the, the novel of Stendhal, especially Le Rouge et le Noir. There's a great story, not of love and passion, but also of society, politics, and the combination between the personal, the social, and political. So that's a, that's a classic novel of understanding a society, not just individual dramas. So it's a fascinating. And there are many other great novels, but definitely that one is uh, one that affected me. Um, I would say that when I was young, before I wanted to become an economist, I was fascinated by uh, psychology, psychoanalysis. And uh, I read the, one of the first books of Sigmund Freud, The Interpretation of Dreams. And every time I had a dream, I would write it down and try to analyze it. So before I became an economist, I thought I'd become a psychoanalyst. And from Freud, I started reading the books and the work of the Frankfurt School, uh, school uh, like uh, Adorno, Oppenheimer, Marcuse, and the mixture of uh, psychoanalysis and Marxist. And then from there, I became a pseudo-Marxist, probably I was more of a limousine socialist. But then from Marx, I learned uh, about Keynes and I became uh, a mainstream economist. So I arrived to mainstream economics via Sigmund Freud, uh, the Frankfurt School, Marcuse, and then uh, Marx. And then from there, I reached uh, understanding of economic system more in a more mainstream way. So. Ma dernière question sera, c'est pas une question en fait, c'est laisser un, un conseil pour les jeunes générations, une, une bouteille à la mer, quelque chose d'impérissable. Yeah, I teach young people and they tell me, given all these mega threats, uh, you know, what I can do. Uh, and I say many things. Of course, dealing with climate change requires collective choices. But each of us, we can make small sacrifices individually to reduce our carbon footprints, lots of them. They're not easy, but we could. So we cannot just wait for the government to do it. We have to do it. And we have to also organize ourselves politically and socially, organizations, social society, if not political party. So you have to be engaged. You can resolve things individually first. Two, uh, you have to study and you have to make sure you're not going to become obsolete because of AI, machine learning, robotic automation. I would say you should major in probably STEM, science, engineering, math, technology, computer science, but you also should have a minor in liberal arts. You have to think critically, read well, write well, and those kind of soft skills are going to allow you to change jobs because over the lifetime, you're never gonna have the same job in the same industry with the same company forever, like it used to be the case. You have to be flexible, nimble to change jobs. So a combination of understanding technology and being a critical mind is gonna allow you to uh, succeed and thrive rather than becoming obsolete. And you have to realize that life is a marathon, it's not a sprint. You have to study hard, college degree, graduate degrees, relearn all your time, retrain yourself, try to be flexible, learn to be curious. And also in your investment decisions, 
If you do day trading, if you gamble with crypto, meme stocks, SPACs, you're going to lose your shirt. You have to invest and save every day. doesn't matter that you don't have enough income. You should save every year 15% of your income because your social security is not going to be there when you retire. There will be too many old people, not enough young. So you have to have an additional leg of private savings. You have to have a diversified portfolio, U.S. global equities, variety of assets, commodities, domestic, foreign. And you're not going to make 100% per year. Nobody does. You make 8 to 10%, but the principle of compound interest, 8% per year, compounds a lot of money over the long term. And if you work hard, study hard, retain yourself, you become intellectually curious, you save, you invest in an investment way, not a speculative way, over time, you're going to do well. So think of life as being a marathon rather than a sprint. And if you do that, probably you're going to survive and thrive in spite of the mega threats, especially if you're engaged with society, with your political system, to make this a better world for yourself, for your friends, for your family, for your children, for your fellow humans. Noriel Rubini, merci infiniment d'être venu nous voir. Thank you very much for having me today. It was a great pleasure.